As we come closer to the 4th of July, <coughs> the alleged Day of Independence, it would be good to think about where our culture and other sort of things came from. And one of the more forgotten or less well-known elements, or the primary element from where our culture comes from, can be still found in many areas, but it sort of goes below the surface, and there's the connection to the so-called pirate republics or barbary states, or barbarian states, Barbary, of course, is for barbarian, of North Africa. And we are very much misled on this subject. Of course, one of the first areas that we can look at, especially considering it will be the 4th of July, is the use of the so-called Mameluk sword in the United States Marine Corps. This is carried by non-commissioned officers and, of course, officers. I myself learned the manual of arms or the sword manual for how to conduct the de different drills and whatnot with this weapon. And it comes from North Africa. Now, in the Marine Corps, it is described to a battle or battles at Tripoli. However, one does not generally adopt the weapons of a defeated opponent. They adopt the weapons of a respected warrior. A respected warrior shows how to use a weapon effectively, and thus others will adopt that weapon. They don't usually tend to adopt weapons from defeated enemies because that means that the weapons are not useful. Now, not only the military connection, but also the governmental collect connection, such as the uh, establishment of republics and how they're formed and many other things you can find in my video, Pirates and the Public, which talks about race publica or the public thing, which is where the word republic comes from. And that additionally comes directly from influences of North Africa. However, this video is going to focus mainly on the architectural side of this subject. Our first piece of literature that will help shed light on the barbarian heritage the primar that primarily influences the Americas can be found 11 time adventure to travel submissions of Chevalier Darvoux 1653 to 1697 by Warren H. Lewis. Now, of course, a lot would say that the influence into the Americas comes from the European. However, it first passes through the Barbary states because the so-called Barbary Corsairs or Barbary pirates, they all traveled by boat. And many of them came to the Americas despite the amount of suppression that is conducted to keep this, this uh, element from being shown. It is very apparent in history and in the different patterns that emerge throughout culture, tradition, government, military, and of course, architecture. Let's look further. On page 168, it states, the town of Algiers was not an attractive place, densely thronged, noisy, with very narrow streets, streets darkened by overhanging balconies on either side and obstructed by kiosks, little built on rooms jutting out into them and depriving them of air. Rooms which Darvu discovered, he does not tell us how, were the women, women's bedoirs. The better class of Algerian house was built on the lines of a con, a square or rectangular structure with a central courtyard and cloistered living rooms on all four sides. Above were flat roofs where the occupants took the air in the evening. For those more energetically inclined, the mole, an imposing stone semicircle 900 feet long by 30 feet by 30 broad, was a favorite place to enjoy the evening breeze off of the sea. In one respect, Algiers was more fortunate than the average oriental town. It had an ample supply of good water brought in on an ancient aqueduct two miles long, which supplied some 125 public fountains. Darvu's first impression of Algiers, however, was that it contained nothing worthy of admiration except its mosques, which were magnificent. It would be difficult to add anything to the delicacy of these buildings, and the projecting galleries of the minarets, from which the marabouts summon the people to prayer. But unfortunately, Christians are strictly forbidden to enter these mosques, though no one prevents you from inspecting their exteriors. 
As usual in his walks about any oriental town, Darvu had his eyes and ears open for any information which might be welcomed by Louvois at the war office, and he made as careful an examination of the town's seven fortresses as circumstances permitted. His verdict was that all of them had been cheaply built, and that if an expeditionary force once established a beachhead and batteries were erected, the demolition of the fortress would be a short and inexpensive business, and that after their fall, the town would not hold out for long though its crenellated walls were pretty thick and built of stone. Outside each of the five landward gates, much the same scene greeted the visitor, a cemetery, several brick cooking stoves, and a few hermitages inhabited by marabouts, the Algerian version of the dervishes of Turkey. Darvu, however, with that appetite for horrors which characterized his country, was interested in only two of them, the Alsasabe and the Balaoud. At the former, an Italian had recently been burnt alive for being an insolvent debtor, though the Balaud, conveniently near to the wood market, was the usual place for burning Christians. Darvu does not explain the horrible death of this unfortunate Italian, but it is clear that this was an exceptional case, for elsewhere he says the Christians are never burnt except those who have become Muslims and afterwards try to rejoin the Christian church. At the Balaud gate there was... The other great tourist attraction, the hooks. These hooks were iron bars horizontally sunk in and unequally spaced along the town wall, with their sharpened ends bent upwards at right angles to the shafts of the bars, and their use was to inflict death upon the Moors, rebels, traitors, and other criminals for whom a slow death was intended. Now, in Puebla, in Mexico, there is a particular building that marks the French influence into the town, and it is in the central historic or historic center in a building where Starbucks is now located and it's next to a diner. And this structure was built from Schwartz and Mirror Constructors, it's French, at Paris. And this pattern of North African influence from the Barbary states and of course, Barbary meaning barbarian, that moniker has come directly from, well, you can probably imagine from whom. But the Merida Yucatan, you find similar architecture that is representing the influence from North Africa in the archways in the Khan, that square quadrangle building, and also in the white of the city. It is, in fact, called the White City. Also, in Cuenca, Ecuador, you will find a similar pattern with the architecture, especially when it comes to the dome shape of the cathedrals. And considering all these elements mixed together into one area, it can only corroborate the point of view that this is influenced from North African traders that came over long before any sort of Spanish conquest or any other such a... Uh, uh, nonsensical propaganda was established. And also in Puebla, Ecuador, you find not only the similar structure of North African style in the cathedral, but you also find those same minarets and uh, uh, other old-style fortifications that you noticed mention of in the Levantine Adventure book. Now, to look at a different period, about 200 years later, being that the Levantine Adventure was set from writers in the 17th century. Let's go ahead to the 19th century in the book Algiers in 1857, its accessibility, climate, and resources described with special reference to English invalids. Also details of recreation obtainable in its neighborhood added for the use of travelers in general by the Reverend E. W. L. Davies, M. A. Oxon, vicar of Adling Fleet and Rural Dean of Selwy, London, Longman, Brown, Green, Longmans and Roberts, 1858. And of course, the Levantine Adventure is from the French perspective. This is from the English. On page 20, the town of Algiers has a population of 70,000 and stands against a precipitous hill in the form of an equilateral triangle, the base of which rests on the sea while the apex is formed by the Caspa, the ancient fortress of the days. 
The lower half, with the exception of two grand mosques, consists of wharfs, warehouses, government houses, squares, and streets, principally built and occupied by the French, while the upper ha half is almost exclusively Moorish, both in building and population. The Place Royale covers more than two acres of ground in the center of the city and is adorned with orange and lime trees. A pleasant fountain and a fine equestrian statue of the unfortunate Duke of Orléans, two large streets called Baba Lud and Baba Sun, running north and south, intersect the city and where not that as a thoroughfare for carriages and general traffic, they are somewhat narrow and confined. Nothing could be more convenient than the colonnades by which they are flanked, so that let the weather be fair or foul, rain or sunshine, there the invalid may always have a pleasant promenade with shade or shelter from one end of Algiers to the other. There is also an exposition of native industry and produce, a museum, a Roman Catholic and a French Protestant church, a Jew synagogue, and the hanging gardens of Barango, in which the baby and invalid portion of the community do largely preponderate. But the special interest of the visitor will be directed to the Moorish town, the square of substantial flat-roofed houses standing one above the other in irregular succession. The peepholes meant for windows, but especially intended to exclude inquisitive eyes fortified with strong iron grating in lieu of glass, resemble nothing so much as domestic prisons, in which while the corsair traversed the seas in search of prey, he locked up his ladies to guard them from harm and to keep from his own susceptible bosom the demon of jealousy. At all events, those iron bars and that gloomy grating over every aperture in the dead walls look ominous and are as suggestive of many romantic love adventure and many a tragic scene. The terrace of the house, that is to say the flat roof, is the exclusive domain of the ladies, here sportive and artless children, and loosely clad in gossy and light attire, they expect not and they get not the intrusion of man. But for some time after the French had taken the city and established themselves in it, and before they were aware of the full extent of that seclusion to which the Moorish ladies were condemned, or gallant and gay, and as conquerors disregarding a prejudice that confined such fair women to such foul thraldom, they were rash enough occasionally to mount on the roof of an unoccupied house, and with telescope in hand to survey deliberately the dark-eyed beauties as they watered their roses or sat enjoying the soft breeze of their charming climate. The act proved a fatal one to many a brave young officer of the French army. The crack of the rifle was heard, and the victim was seen to topple headlong on the terrace. But then, none ever knew who drew the deadly trigger, nor who directed the unerring ball. A peep at a fair ma modesque was held to be poor compensation for so tremendous a risk, so for the time the sport was abandoned. Next part, page 42. Some French General Wade has made capital roads in zigzag fashion through these beautiful valleys, and great reason have we to thank him, whoever he may be, for the many pleasant exploratory rides and picnics which were, we were en enabled to enjoy through his instrumentality. I think not of a horse that kicks if he only don't give, said a Yorkshire man once in our hearing, and if he had seen two Arab steeds flinch from the collar, their thin skins don't like the drudgery and back. Now, on page 64, it states, The monastery is a plain square building distinguished by no architectural pretension whatever. It has an open quadrangle in the center, which is ornamented by many curious flowers, orange trees in full bearing, and a fountain, clear and beautiful water, in which gold and silver fish flourish and sport in their element the spacious outbuildings intended for farm and other purposes are attached to the monastery, while outside of these high wall encompassing a hundred acres of garden, vineyard, orchards, and cemetery surrounds the home enclosure. Beyond this again, the cultivated farm encircles the whole in a ring fence by the produce of which the establishment is maintained and the simple wants of the brotherhood amply supplied. Of course, he is talking about the con. Then, under chapter 3, the immediate environs of Algiers are beautiful beyond description. Saint Eugene on one side and Mustafa Superior on the other, flank the city with via and garden scenery, 
such as we read in, of in fairy tales but seldom see in reality. The surrounding hills on either side slope gradually to the blue water's edge, and on every available plateau stands a Moorish house, white and simple in itself, but adorned by the most exquisite verdure. Red geraniums in full bloom and beauty, pomegranates and myrtles, orange and citron trees, bearing at once the fruit and the flower, remind one of Aladdin's garden, in which jewels depend, depended upon from the bowers and perfume filled the air. Now on page 57, several acres of ground are especially devoted to the cultivation of the cactus cochenilifera, on which the insects, which constitutes cochineal fields and exists, it is planted in long rows at a distance of six feet apart, and those rows on which the insects swarm are covered by matting to protect them from bad weather. When feeding upon the cactus leaf, the insects look like so many dried cur currants flowered over and ready for a mince pie. But if they were popped into it, they would probably be not so palatable. Already it has been pretty well ascertained that the climate is not adapted to the production of cochineal, so England must get the color for her red jackets and bit of pink for the hunting field from some old colony. Soldiers under punishment do the heavy labor of the garden. New roads and public works are also constructed by the same hands. Thus, their penal exercise is turned to account and morale as well as material improvements are executed not only without expense but with great advantage both to the country and the delinquents. Now that part's interesting where it talks about penal work but that they're soldiers doing it. So I wonder what's going on there. Now, the official report of General Desval on the, or De, Deval, that probably is Desval, on the artesian borings executed in the Sahara of the province of Constantine in 1856 7 has just been published by the Moniteur Algerien and is not without interest. A civil engineer, a sergeant of Spahis, and a detachment of soldiers of the Foreign Legion suffice for the work, which commenced early in May 1856 in an oasis of the Oued Rear. His first essay was most successful on the 19th of June at Perfect River, yielding 4,010 quarts of water per minute at a temperature of 21 degrees, burst from the bowels of the earth. The joy of the Arabs was indescribable. The news of this miraculous gush of water so precious in the desert spread rapidly through the country. People came from afar to see the spring to which the Maraboots with solemn ceremonies gave the name of the Fountain of Peace. The soldiers who had wrought the seeming miracle returned to Biscara without a single sick man, although during the period of their labors the centigrade thermometer had often marked 460 in the shade. Two other borings were also successful. But the supply of water was much less abundant. First of the two wells, which received the name of Fountain of the Benediction, yielding only 35 quarts a minute from a depth of 84 meters, second 120 quarts at the depth of 58 meters, the gratitude of the Arabs knew no bounds, and they showed the most friendly feeling towards the slender detachment of soldiers who lived amongst them for weeks and months together at long distances from French garrisons. In the oasis of Sidi Rahed, which was totally unproductive for want of water, an artisan well known as the Fountain of Gratitude yields at the depth of 54 meters no less than 4,300 quarts of water per minute. When the shouts of the soldiers announced the gush, the Arabs sprang crowds to the spot, laying themselves in the welcome abundance into which mothers dipped their children while the old sheikh fell upon his knees and wept, and returned thanks to Allah and to the French. At Om Tior, a well sunk to the depth of 170 meters and yielding 180 quarts a minute was at once taken as a center of a settlement by a portion of a previously nomadic tribe. As soon as the water appeared, they began the construction of a village and the plantation of 1,200 date trees and entirely renounced their wandering existence. According to General Desvaux's report, these artisan wells are likely to have most important influence on the Arab life and greatly to subdue the roaming propensities of many of the tribes. And there, of course, you get an idea of the perspective of not only this writer, but many of these people that consider themselves these amazing conquerors, is that instead of thinking about 
uh, well, either way, they view everything through the lens of conquest. And they didn't obviously think about the fact that these fountains hold a different position that does not relate to, quote, you know, subduing. Now, of course, the importance of fountains, and especially central square fountains, can be found all throughout the Americas and is very apparent in the city of Puebla in Mexico, as is, it is in most historical centers of various cities throughout the world. In the Americas, anyway. <laughs> And here we get some examples with these different fountains that you find around the cathedral. And clearly they hold a prominent importance that can be directly linked to the cultures of North Africa. Which is yet just another corroborating piece of evidence to show us that the true heritage of the Americas is mainly from North Africa as well as the addition people of the various American continents. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please like it, share it, subscribe to my channel, check out my other content. There are free books available at the link, and if you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal or Cash App. Thank you.